Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, recorded at 1 p.m., 6 p.m. UK time. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 16th of December, 2019. So last week, we recorded the show with no pre-show. We just sat down, turned our little cameras on, and we just talked, and it worked out pretty well. We're not always brave enough to do that. This week, we've had a pre-show, and we've had two semi-tapings where we had some technical difficulties. This is the third try. We're going to do this between the uh, beeping alarms that uh, Gavin has set up on his clocks uh, over there in England. And uh, so we got like, what, 30 minutes before the next uh, line of uh, tweets, twitters, and beeps. Let's talk about your responsibility as the viewer, and that's to click the like button on Facebook or YouTube. You see this video somewhere down there, there's a like button, click it. If you are one of the few paid people that are required to watch us for your, your work and you don't like us, you have our permission to click the do not like button. That's fine, no big deal. We will get over it. If you're not subscribed to this yet and you want to get instant updates every time there's a new episode, click that little red rectangle down there and click the little bell that pops up afterwards. You will be subscribed to all new editions of Anglican Unscripted and get a little pop up in your uh, uh, phone or your browser. Finally, what else have I, uh, oh, comments. This show always continues in the comments. And once again, last week, we had what? I thought we were done with those. How, you got an extra one back there somewhere. <laughs> it's slow. <laughs> it's got a slow <laughs> clock. <laughs> the show continues in the comments. And if you get a chance, go there and give us your opinion on the topic of the day. And the topic of the day is pretty cool. We're not going to just talk about Anglicanism on Anglican uh, on script. We always go a little further. Today, we're talking about Roman Catholicism and their wokeness. Uh, we're not talking about where scripture says, wake up, O sleeper. Uh, we're talking about the PC woke. And uh, if you've paid any attention to the news in the last month, you've seen chaos. Uh, the impeachment of Trump is happening this week in uh, the United States. We just had Boris Johnson elected and the conservatives in the UK. We had uh, Time Magazine uh, put Greta Van Thornton uh, on as the person of the year. We've had Chick-fil-A uh, kind of screw over all their uh, loyal fans and uh, several other things. That, oh, Hallmark Channel uh, decided, hey, we're going to ban that lesbian commercial. And then they got a call and a bunch of death threats. And they said, ah, we weren't going to ban that after all. So it's just <clears throat> crazy what's going on in the world. And I thought we could add the craziness to not only the Anglican denomination, but the uh, Roman Catholicism denomination as well. Starting with Vet, uh, Greta uh, Thornburg. That's not how you pronounce her name. How do you pronounce her name? Greta Thornburg. It's Monday. The brain doesn't always work with the, the mouth on Mondays. It's okay. Uh, I saw that she's being appreciated by some uh, uh, Roman Catholics, George. Well, Cardinal Peter Turkson, who is the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, on December 12th released a uh, paper, and in the paper there was a statement that Greta Thunberg uh, is a great witness to what the Catholic Church teaches on the care of the environment and the care of the person. So this sort of left me gasping, uh, because this is an atheist Swede, uh, who is uh, pursuing, uh, I don't, I would almost say an anti-Christian worldview about creation and nature, and she is being labeled as being in consonant with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, I mean, I, th you know, Time Magazine picking her over Hong Kong protesters, I could see, because Hong Kong, because Time Magazine has interests in China, therefore they're covering their financial backside. But I don't see why the Cardinal Turkson would would sort of lift up this person, a uh, symbol of the most extreme uh, political correctness, as being someone whom the Catholic world should emulate. Well, is she just another virgin, 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 virgin of Mary? I'm sorry. <laughs> 
faux pas. <laughs> Is she another version of Mary Gavin? I think that what the what the Catholic Church is doing is something very similar to what the Anglican Church is doing, and then, and it's it's chasing customers by celebrating wokeness, and, and wokeness is the wrong side of the culture war, and the reason this is the wrong side of the culture war is that uh, in in the Book of Deuteronomy we have some some absolutely wonderful guidance on how to take care of the earth, how to let the earth rest, how to give the earth a Sabbath. Uh, how to treat the earth with, with, with proper stewardship. So it's a distinction between a kind of collegial stewardship with the resources of the earth and worship. Now that, that distinction is dealt with in the Old Testament time and time again because um, human beings find it quite difficult sometimes to believe in the God they haven't seen, the Father who created the universe. When there are a bunch of people saying, placate your earth mother because she's much closer and you can see her and uh, and the temptation is to turn stewardship into worship. In a way, the, the present green movement is very is very close to that, and it's probably energized by by this theological dimension we've been talking about for some time, which is the um, the earth's the earth uh, mother sky father polarity. And, and one of the reasons that not the only reason, but one of the reasons why God is spoken of as our father is to make a, a great distinction between between our experience of the earth and fertility as our mother now the problem with the green movement is that uh in, in its wokeness it's beginning to um so love so protect so uh, uh so care for the environment that it becomes very close to a goddess and actually it bears much of the much of the hallmark of the spirituality of the goddess so greta thunberg is really uh an an, an apocalyptic prophet warning of the damage we're doing to the to the goddess from whom we have sprung. Now, one of the things I think the church should be doing is saying um, there are all kinds of things the green movement can tell us that are very important. I myself am, am enraged and in despair about the the, the plastic pollution of the oceans, uh, and, and and any green green movement that holds our industrial and capitalist complex to account for the ghastly pollution of plastic in the stomachs of seabirds and fishes. I'm, I'm right behind. But there's a real difference between saying we're behaving badly, we're, we're defecating on our own doorstep, so to speak, and, um, and giving ourselves to the protection of Mother Earth in a way that is, is, is so woke it becomes religious and spiritual. Now, the Green Movement has always been a kind of, a kind of feminine spiritual movement of spirituality. And I would have hoped that one of the things that, that, that theologians could do today is to give people some help in distinguishing how the way in which sex and gender have a theological impact on how we understand our relationship with both the Father who made the earth and the earth we live on and with. I think it's unfortunate that contemporaneous with the release of the CDF statement, where Greta Thunberg is a great witness to the church's teachings on the environment and the care of persons. Greta Thunberg made some statements that those who oppose climate sh change uh, science should be put up against the wall. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so very Marxist of her. I, I, very so I, Marxist of her. <laughs> so I, I uh, now granted this is a 16 year old girl who has uh, as has been stated, has is public knowledge that he has some uh, psychological difficulties with autism and whatnot. So one doesn't really listen to 16-year-olds except if they're oracles in the temple in Delphi. Uh, so it was unfortunate in the timing that the Catholic Church tied its wagon to a figure that uh, could so tarnish so easily. But I think for me the disappointment is that at one time, I'm a Protestant. I have no uh, no uh, illusions about uh, what I believe or don't believe. But I always look towards the people like uh, uh, when Cardinal Ratzinger ran the CDF, that I could read his things and I could follow along in the trajectory he was going. There was so much that I could take away that was helpful, supportive, and understanding. I may disagree with him about some stuff in the weeds, now, some people say the weeds were probably the most important things, but I could follow along and say his work informs me as a Protestant and enriches me spiritually. We now have a Vatican 
under the Francis experiment, what is it, six years now, that has adopted a social and political program that is, well, it's being rejected at the polls, is rejected uh, in Brazil when the Catholic Church backed the left and the country voted the most largest Catholic Church in the world in terms of population, Brazil, put in a pro-business uh, uh, anti-Catholic leader, Yar Bolsonaro. Uh, Bolsa, uh, yeah, Bolsonaro. His electoral strategies aren't working, but at the same time, there seems to be a funny link where Francis is, seems to be speaking and on the same level as the Greta Thunbergs, not on the level of the man and the woman in the pew or in the street. Well, he was raised in South America, and, and as such, his uh, upbringing was in a, in a socialist economy. And his uh, upbringing was also, I'm trying to remember where he went to seminary. It doesn't pop off the top of my mind, but I'm sure it was so. Do you, do you remember? Is South the, America somewhere? I, think, I, I don't, but the book I found quite helpful recently is with a fairly dramatic title called The Dictator Pope. It mm -hmm. suggests that the, the greatest influence on, on Francis was, was Perron. Yeah. And that, that he's he's actually well, one of the things he's doing is doing something that Peron did. There's a kind of there's a South American Peronist language which which says two things at once which are opposite to each other, <laughs> and it, it rather confuses your the people you're communicating with because um, because they're neither paradoxical, uh, paradoxically virtuously related, but they're actually co rather contradictory, and so the, the critics of Francis have been saying that actually he's. He's adopting a fairly high, highly authoritarian Peronist approach to to the moral issues, and consequently, the faithful are finding this a bit difficult. Um, that's the quarter pass one, George. George, that's one I want to accept a, pa a pass for. Um, so, um, uh, but but the, there are a lot of Catholics who are finding this cultural confusion, theological confusion, very, very difficult indeed, and. Um, uh, you know, they're the ones who've who've put the dubia to Francis and said, "Okay, well, thank you for your last letter. We have some questions. Would you mind explaining it to us because we're confused and and there hasn't been an explanation." Uh, there and were, then there, are, go on, George. Well, there was a movement about that began about twenty years ago in the United States of Catholics and Evangelicals coming together, led by Chuck Colson and Richard John Newhouse, the editor mm. of First Things. And it was quite clear where they disagreed on certain doctrinal issues, but they found that. The conservative evangelicals and traditional Roman Catholics in the United States shared a common moral worldview, a common understanding of our responsibilities to the earth, to each other. And so that what we saw was that the Catholic Church, uh, people like Avery Dulles, could influence prominent evangelicals. Um, and we were all moving and pulling in the same direction. This is not something where, like, I'm talking about archic, where we're looking for corporate reunion, mm -hmm. but we're looking for a shared ethos, a shared, you know, sh what are the as many possible things that we can understand and work together and share in the world? And and, and the disappointment I, as a convinced Protestant, have with Francis is that that era is over, because we can't look to uh, the Catholic Church's institutions. We can look to Catholics. But we can't look to in some of the institutions as basically g getting our back, so to speak, in the culture wars in the United States. Well, I think there's a think... danger. Go ahead, Gavin. You finish up. Well, I think there's a danger sometimes in in, in being too too Catholic, George, from the outside, um, because because Francis is not he, he, the notion of the infallibility of the Pope. Uh, it doesn't mean that when when the present Pope speaks, he's got it right. Uh, Catholics have got a very keen sense of the fallibility of the Pope, and it's getting keener at the moment. Um, but but he, the 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 Catholic Church has a long a long tradition in which the Pope can't change belief. So it may be that some some bishops in the Catholic Church, as in the Anglican Church, uh, find that their judgment isn't as all that it should be. Um, but but they, they pass away and the traditions of the church remain the same. They don't get to change the doctrine or the nature of what the church believes. They, they just cause a certain amount of flurry of excitement as, as they go. And the, the, on the whole, the less, the better. So I, I think in a way that the, the, the best attitude 
towards Francis is to to, to let him express his Peronist, Peronistic theological flair and, um, and wait for the next pope. What is so funny about that is that that's the attitude I take to the bishops in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I saw that. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, okay, that's nice. Well, we'll just wait till you're gone and I'll find somebody who I like. Well, yep. j just in politics, there's always a swinging pendulum. You know, here in America, we go from uh, uh, liberal to conservative, liberal to conservative with our pendulum. Uh, you know, Clinton's, Bush's, not yeah, quite conservative, uh, Obama's, and, and now Trump. And it's just a pendulum. And I see the same uh, many times in denominations, where there's a, a denomination swinging. And I really see it swinging now in Roman Catholicism as far I think as be very, their, their influence. Be very lucky indeed with... with, with, with and with Benedict, I've shared George's mm. admiration sure. and respect. In fact, my admiration and respect grows greater all the time. The stuff, some of the stuff that Benedict wrote of a pastoral theological nature mm. on the life of Jesus was just superb. Genius. And, and I'm, a, I'm a great, I'm a great uh, admirer of, of John Paul II. Um, it, it, it just may be that um, uh, the clouds of, of distraction that surround Prince Francis represents a, a period that's less helpful you know I, I have to admit i don't really understand the francis phenomenon i've i've read a, a eulogistic uh, biography by austin over ivory and i've read some middle stuff and i've recently read the dictator pope where the peronist uh, uh diagnosis come from and uh, and i have to say i'm i'm not at all clear what's going on but you know the fact is it's it, the Catholics, like us, believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the Pope. They don't believe in bishops for that function. So, so um, uh, there's a great prayer which I used to pray more regularly than I do now. Which, as I get up in the morning, which says, "Lord, help me not become a hindrance to anybody's faith today." <laughs> well, one of the, the influences leaders have, like Trump's uh, legacy, is probably going to be the uh, the federal courts uh, and abortion and a few other things, economy. Um, because he's able to appoint judges he wants in the federal court. Pope Francis is able to appoint cardinals he wants uh, to be cardinals, and he can start picking more liberal uh, cardinals over time, and I think he can stack the deck for who's going to be the next pope as well. Well, certainly Catholics are arguing and talking about that uh, mm -hmm. at present. You're right, the, in terms of the, po the political uh conversations that go on that's a very that's a very big one but then again uh, there's the issue of prayer and that some cardinals change their mind some you know some people have conversions even in late on in in, in the uh, in their lives um so I, I think the danger for all of us is that that we do what we sometimes accuse our opponents of doing which is we put too much effort into the politics of the church and not enough into praying for renewal and conversion well, one, one of the things we've seen in the Anglican world is that the breakdown of authority, the breakdown of understanding, has created a vacuum. Um, GAFCON has tried to fill that, and it's not been successful. The Global South is now trying to fill that. Will that be successful? Justin Welby um, has, as trying to desperately trying to hold the whole enterprise together uh, with personal appeals of fellowship rather than any sense of this is what we all share in common as Christians. And that's, if you will, the critique that many people bring against Anglicanism is it's a cafeteria religion. You believe what you want to believe. A la carte. And it's a la carte or whatnot. Um, is there a danger that the current, the Francis project will leave a cafeteria Catholicism? Such that the United States, we have some bishops say that the Joe Biden cannot receive communion in South Carolina because he is uh, holds these views on abortion, whereas the Cardinal Bishop Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Dolan, says he's welcome to receive communion here. I wouldn't hold that against him. Well, I think is there one, well, Catholicism that's going to arise. One of the bigger things I've witnessed in the rule of Pope Francis is that he wants Roman Catholicism to become Anglican. <laughs> oh my, we're 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 skating on a curious kind of ice at the moment. No, um, I think one of the things I <laughs> one of the things I think I'd respond to George is that as a Catholic, uh, because I've I've been a Catholic Anglican for some time, 
uh, I would say that the great virtue of the church is that the, what 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 so many people celebrate as the Reformation was a Reformation, uh, and that the church has constant Reformations and periods of renewal. And one of the reasons for for, for being Catholic rather than being Anglican is that is that the Reformation became a politicized and a nationalistic event as much as it became a doctrinal one. And, and it removed some of the impetus for reforming and renewing the church out of the church and, and took it away where, where 500 years later, the effect of it has been to produce a thousand different denominations, many of which have become liberal Protestant and nearly extinct. And then you have to say, well, uh, was that the best use of reforming zeal and energy? Um, the great strength of the Roman Catholic Church is that God at least has never given up on it and it continues to have reformations and renewals and you know men we can we'll all have our own favorite version of them St Francis Saint Francis as opposed to Pope Francis is, is one that a lot of people look to in their knowledge of history but but but, but they never stop so the fact is uh, we may be in a period of uh, of the poor part of the cycle that Kevin has explained, um, but but if you if you believe in the church, it's hard not to have hope that the Lord, the Spirit, will continue to reform and to renew as long as people get to their knees. Just looking at the last fifty years of church history, and I'm just giving you the perspective of a guy who grew up in, in the Midwest. Uh, when I was a kid, the Lutherans didn't talk to the Roman Catholics. The Roman Catholics didn't talk to the Baptists. The Baptists didn't talk to the Methodists. Basically, all denominations were closed-minded and did not have any relationships outside of their own denomination. Uh, churches just didn't talk to each other. And if you went to a church, you didn't talk to people outside your church. Midwest, America, 1950s, 60s, 70s. That's changed now. There's a whole different uh, ethos in churches operating and working together and breaking down barriers. And they look to find more in common now than ever before in the last 1500 years, from what I can tell. Once again, perspective of middle America, 1970s. Do you guys see the same? No, uh, because I live in Christendom still, in that part of the United States where there's still a Christian world do predominates. You don't have mm -hmm. that in New England. And, that's, and you don't have that in the Northwest Pacific area. No. Sure, but you do have uh, you do have that in portions of the uh, rural South where I am. So the impetus towards the ecumenical imperative is rather small, because we're all competing for the same population, if you will, and so there's very little inter uh, church work, but there is interfaith work. We work closely with our local synagogue uh, because there's such a small element in society; it's not an issue, but. Yeah, uh, on your major point, yes, Kevin, the United States, the, the brand loyalty is disappearing fast, uh, and churches are more than willing to work with each other. But by the same token, those churches that are increasing in membership and in denomination are those that have been applying more rigor to uh, their membership. In other words, you have to believe this. Uh, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to worship at Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal Church. You cannot be a... Uh, uh, a cafeteria agnostic. Well, I believe this, I don't believe that. I mean, there's certain things that are required of you if you're going to worship with us. And those churches that have made that, I don't want to say uh, confessional stance, because that implies something I'm not trying to say, but those who have a, confessional churches are doing very well in the United States, at least my part of the world. I think I would take a different view too, Kevin, and I, I would make a distinction between supernatural and rational. So I think one of the reasons why um, it was very difficult for the rational, for the children of the Reformation, to speak to one another was because there was a, there was a, there was a self-confident dogmatism in the way in which traditions had developed. You know, we we've thought our way through to this position, sometimes in contrast to other people, and we think we're right, and we think we have the best, the best way of following Jesus. And so, why do we need to talk to anybody else? Uh, the difficulty is that that that. Um, it's almost as if, and I'm not, I'm not saying out of any partisan spirit, at least I, I hope I'm not. It's almost as if that within the last 50 or 60 years, there's something in the Reformation Protestant movement that's run out of steam. Uh, the, 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 the pure rationalism and, and self-confidence of, of, a, of a worked out dogmatic faith like that 
um, has run out of steam a bit. And the real commonality of language is between those who believe in the supernatural and those who don't. And therefore, the easiest uh, allegiance is between Roman Catholics and Pentecostals. Because, because both Roman Catholic and Pentecostalism um, have a, a, a very a shared openness to the dramatic in, intervention of God in prayer. Both celebrate miracles. Um, both both are holiness movements. Uh, and it's a bit in between there that has is, is got a bit stuck. And, and part of my take on what's going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years is that I, I see the Protestant middle as being... Uh, overcome by the rising, the rising ecological tide, so to speak, leaving the mountains of Pentecostalism and Roman Catholicism still breaking the surface with a shared worldview that is essentially, uh, essentially, fueled by holiness and, and supernatural. I, I, I would, I agree with ninety nine percent of what you say, Gavin, and I would wish I had said some of what you had said because it applies to our situation here. However, I think the, the the one little thing I would mention is that that work vision you have is geographically bounded, um, because Catholicism uh, and Pentecostalism in South America, in Africa, uh, are mortal enemies. Um, Pentecostals uh, dislike and have a great deal of animosity towards the Catholic Church because many of them came from the Catholic Church. And the spiritual experiences that they're finding in Pentecostalism were not part of their Catholic experience. So it, so the, uh, where I'm coming from is that the institutions, the institutional hierarchy of the Francis Catholic Church in South America, the Brazilian Catholic Church being a prime example of a church that is just imploding because it has abandoned the supernatural for the politically correct. So here, George, I want to say something that is about probably the most important thing I've ever said on Anglican Unscripted, in my judgment, <laughs> which is that, 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 that Satan has a trick. <laughs> and, and one of his most powerful tricks to break the church is to present us with the worst aberrational form of each other's behavior. And then, and then we say, look at those terrible people. We have seen how badly they behave or how badly they present. Here, here are their worst excesses. Are they absolutely terrible? So you hear in, amongst Roman Catholics, the most pejorative said, things said about Pentecostals, uh, treating their relig religion as though it's you know, the worst of all kinds of superstitions. And, and, and who hasn't heard the worst things that one could say about Roman Catholics? I think the problem with the problem with this is, first of all, I think it's diabolically inspired, um, and a great failure of discerning spirit on on our behalf as as we enter into those small aspects of it that we too play our part in. But I but I think that 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 it's it's a also it's a dreadful misreading of of Christian theology and Christian tradition. Um, it's absolutely true. One can present a a. a a perverted picture of Roman Catholicism, the worst thing they've ever done, the worst things they believe, the, the worst Catholics we've ever met, and it becomes quite disgusting and, and reprehensible. And one, one can do that to Pentecostals, we've, you know, again, one could even do it to Episcopalians. <laughs> um, but I think, I think that's, that's a failure of the spiritual task. I think one of the things the Lord asks us to do is to keep a, a very keen nose open for perversions of the faith, which we all engage in to some extent from time to time but also a keen hunger for charisms that that the lord has given that get hidden by our antipathies and a certain amount of misrepresentation that goes on i think i get very saddened by by the way in which in theological discussion very often christians find themselves slagging each other off using the very worst examples when it's it's kind of lazy and, and a bit corrupt it doesn't need to be that way <laughs> Well, I, again, everything you say, I, I agree with you, but the difficulty is in places, uh, you know, my experience of the Catholic Church is not a church of which uh, uh, I have a high opinion, and that is not because of issues of doctrine or discipline. A doctrine is issues of discipline, of that those people anointed or held out to be the spokesmen and the leaders are not as uh, not the right people in other words the McCarrick Catholic Church in the United States the the, the abuse crisis uh, 
you know, we have a congregation of about 600 people. They all showed up simultaneously. Maybe 200 of them are Roman Catholics. And to, I don't want to say to a man, but a great many of them have entered the Episcopal Church in revulsion to their experiences as lay Roman Catholics. So it's... I, I think it's, that's... So, entirely, so, the, entirely. so the, the theological vision which you're expressing mm. is true, but the practical reality of crappy priests get sent to the countryside and they don't get disciplined. And so what happens is they drive people into Protestantism because they're so awful. But that, that's absolutely true. Of course it is. And, and it, it's almost, uh, it's almost a bit like gossip. You know, why do, why do we like gossip? Because we've got a certain, we're drawn a bit to the work, to the worst of the most scandalous stories. And we go, <gasps> you know, and, and give ourselves a, a, a thrill of moral fervor. But, but the fact is, you know, McCarrick is not an example of Catholicism. He's an example of, 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 of distorted sexualized pedophilia hiding in a church. And yeah. there are examples of, of that happening in, in families, in churches, in scout groups all over the place. When I'm, if, if I want to think well of Anglicanism, I think of John Donne. Uh, and, and John Donne has more of an impact or to than Justin Welby to me. If I want to think of Catholicism, I, I think of, of some Martin de Tour, whom I absolutely adore, or Thomas More, or, uh, or, or John Henry Newman. Um, and they, they have a much more powerful impact on me than, than McCarrick does. So I think, once again, it's a matter of how we allow ourselves to be informed and inspired or despired. Um, I think we have a responsibility to try and be as inspired as we are despired. Because otherwise, we're not really being faithful. One thing's God's done gratuitously in, in, in every part of his church. Um, you know, I mean, Wesley, um, I, I'm not very impressed by contemporary Methodists I meet, but, but, but Wesley, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make a party point because he started off as an Anglican. You know, there, there is something absolutely glorious about the Wesleyan revival and what it has to teach the rest of the church as a way of capturing the wind of the spirit of god in our in the sails of faith so i i, I really i i i think that we're it's incumbent on us all to uh, to be as sensitive to the, the goodness and the holiness that god has produced in each tradition as we are to the corruption that again i agree with everything that you say but then we come back to the pastoral example of my child is 12 years old now and the ideal church that you describe is not around me. And what do I do? Do I just, you know, do I homeschool and live in a farm? Uh, or do I, how do I act in the world? And what do I, what can I do today? Not what this church should be, but what is it like today? And what do I need to do for my family now? And that's well, also, I think the issue that we're facing in the United States with the collapse of... Well uh, I mean, I have, you know, my children do not attend the Episcopal Church in the areas where they live because, frankly, it's dreadful. Seattle and Los Angeles. Oh, jeez. Uh, and, and... <laughs> Was that a prayer, Kevin? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, and, and I, but, they, but they have found faith communities, uh, both, in the, both in an Anglican, uh, both in the Anglican ethos. Uh, well, I would say to my children, as oh, I do uh, say to my should children, should I say to them, go, hold on, kids, wait, you know, it, it'll take 25 years for John Bruno's poison to leave the diocese of Los Angeles. But if you hold on, your grandchildren will have a good Episcopal Church. No, it's it's no, no, because I because I, I, I think I think that's dogmatism. I think what we do is we say, where do you find Jesus most? Where do you find a community that lets you pray and love most? And if that's if that's with the Pentecostals rather than with the Catholics, then I would say, well, then then do it. Or if the, even if the happens to be a particularly holy Episcopalian woman priest whom I don't approve of. I'd rather my children pursued holiness than that they pursued dogma. So I think I think there are answers to that. They're just they're not they're just not easy ones at all. But once again, I mean, you know, the the, the, the spiritual gift I've prayed for most through most of my life is the one I needed most. It was not was not miracles or tongues or, or uh, it was discernment because I think with with discernment we stand some chance of making the right kind of decisions in those fraught, difficult circumstances. And without it, we become people who belong to systems and, and dogmas without the renewal of the spirit. So I think, I think George, the answer is that we, you know, this is where the kingdom is bigger than the church, isn't it? We, we, we go for where we find most of the kingdom. Uh, an anecdote, I think I may have shared it with 
asked you all before is when I was in seminary, John Allen, who had just stepped down as presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, came to spend a day with the students. And he spoke in chapel and had lunch. And under Allen's watch, uh, we had the first women clergy. And Allen personally opposed women clergy, but he agreed with the, he agreed to go, go along with the majority. And so we had a little Q&A session and some of the women ordinands were asked asked him the question, what do you regret most about your priesthood? In other words, he was talking about the joys. What would you do differently? And with the expected answer, well, I wouldn't oppose women priests like I have. <laughs> he was very quiet and he said, if I were to do things differently, I would not worship the church. I'd worship Jesus Christ. Brilliant. And Brilliant. so what the presiding bishop, the retired presiding bishop told us was that essentially his, in his ministry, his pride at being an Episcopalian, his pride in being a bishop, had blinded him to the kingdom, to the worship of Jesus Christ, which I understand is what you're saying, Gavin. Yeah, uh, is that is. is that a fair estimation? Absolutely. See, there are decent Episcopal bishops. You just have to look for them. <laughs> you look really hard. <laughs> Microscope, get out. Yeah, I see what you're saying. All right, gentlemen, this has been a nice, long, wonderful, warm, drink hot chocolate with marshmallow show we love that you guys sat with us and and watched uh we'll have another show hopefully friday uh we'll have a kevin it's it's in the high 60s here so i have a sweater and a tweed coat it's freezing it's not a warm show. armageddon if you watch the weather channel here in connecticut tomorrow is a nice storm it's armageddon there's no 60 degree anything out there i see them uh, the salt trucks out there pre-treating the roads we're Back giving out front. blankets to the homeless because of the freeze. <laughs> it's going to drop into the high 50s, Kevin. Oh, no. The world I, is coming to an end. I was down in Florida last month. I miss it so much. Oh, well. So uh, watch the next episode of Anglican Unscripted. There's going to be a special interview with uh, Gavin Asherton. And uh, you guys will be informed of a new role in his life. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Nashton, and I can't wait to find out, Kevin. You've been listening to episode 567 of Anglican Unscripted on the 16th of December, 2019. Gavin, we'll give a hint. You're opening a cleaning service with your wife for the West of England. <laughs> yeah. And it was 557, but that's okay. Was it? Oh, Lord, I was distracted, as usual. <laughs>